say on TV. Yeah. Uh, all right. So here we are. <coughs> we we are short one person. We're uh, we were we were short of Jimmy Duck. Jimmy Duck. So good to have you back, Jimmy Duck. Okay. Um, I'm not going to sing anymore. No, I probably will. My name is David Wilson. I am going to do a lot of a lot of show and tell soon, so I'm not going to do a show and tell. Um, my question for tonight is unrelated to Bash programming, and I've asked uh, everyone in the room, and now I'm going to ask Chris, which I think the answer is yes. Are you coming to DevOps Camp? Mm, I'm not sure yet. Okay, well, you know, you only got until Mother's Day to sign up if you want 150 bucks off. Right, right, right. And if it's not your money, maybe you don't care. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that yet. I'm guessing it's probably going to be my money. Oh, okay. I'm not sure though. As you're, you know, you're in good company. Um, I know, uh, I know other uh, fine gentlemen who are not being boss funded. Boss funding is hard to uh, uh, hard to get sometimes. Right. It, well, it, 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 the the boss has a quandary. It he if he sharpens his weapon because you're mainly there to to wreck problems um, or to cause them. Um, uh, if he if he sharpens his weapon, his weapon becomes more expensive. He he, he has a capex followed by an opex in order to get a better weapon. <laughs> huh that's harsh that's a that's a heck of a conundrum for a boss to be in um of course my recommendation is always spend that money and uh you in, invest in your people and they'll invest back um and uh, right. they're at, at devops camp they said it this way they said well what if what if we train joe and he leaves and the the other choice is what if you don't train joe and he stays <laughs> Oh. that's that's good um fortunately i know a lot of joes and uh, all of the joes that i know are very much about developing their skill set um i'm biased by my place in the world uh sort of like cops always sort of like cops tend to see crooks everywhere i see learners everywhere i'm biased by my by my good position in the world hey bird which Zip it. <sighs> if it isn't about bash, you need to just or DevOps camp. All right, thank you. Um, all right, that's all. Uh, but I did my question. Um, I said I'm David Wilson. Uh, I've been teaching this stuff for a long time, so that's my introduction. I'm going to teach the bash tonight, and I call Jimmy Duck. Let me, let me mute out. Otherwise, we get the feedbacks. Yeah. Uh, Ooh. You can you can introduce yourself on my Hello, mic. It's rich. Oh, that's true. I could even get in the camera here, possibly. But uh, yeah, okay. So my uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be back at the fourth and final bash class. This has been awesome. I hope he does it again. I hope to go to DevOps Camp. Well, I will be going. It's just I hope that my boss pays for it. That would be um, so my little thing for tonight, uh, because this was like a real issue over the last few days, is I was trying to write a script where I had two sources of similar information that were slightly different, and I was trying to marry them up, and I was having a hard time doing that. And so I might muck around with that tonight. We're talking bashy things. Um, it was basic. Well, I'll just describe what it was. I've had similar situations. Um, so maybe other people here have had a similar kind of thing. So I had a F5 load balancer and I could see all these addresses coming into this Linux host and, but they were all masked because they were just the source of the two, um, you know, big IP machines. And so I wanted to find out what the source address was and I could go somewhere else and get that address that's getting there. So I had one list that basically looked like a net stat that was like, here's the IP and here's the port, but it's all this um, big IP. 
it's all coming in from the same IP. And here's another one that shows all the unique IPs. And I wanted to like merge the two together. And I was trying to find a way to run my little for loop to grab this information and run my other one to grab this information and say, where you find this, put this in its place. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yep. There you go. I think, <clears throat> I, I think we can, there's a couple of ways we can do it. Uh, we can do just overarching strategy for when we, when we get to it. Um, and I don't know if we'll get to it because we have a lot of really cool issues tonight and I spent almost all of Sunday working on them. Um, whoever put in issue number one, I want to kiss you. Hope you're not in the room. Um, I think it was yours, Corey, actually. I won't kiss you, I promise. Um, uh, Cause, cause that took me like four hours to solve. Um, so it, we're recording, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe going back to this. But. Overarching strategies for your problem um, are looping through the, the, the master side and then grepping against the target side yes. and then doing a, doing some sort of a transform. Yes. Um, there is a utility that may make it easier and faster called join. Okay. Um, and that, that's an, that's an external. So that's not necessarily a, a bash thing, but grep is also an external and we're not being purist here. Call somebody. Okay. I'm kind of building on that because I did find some ways to do it in Perl and Google had other things that anyway. So, um, okay, cool. Talk about that and uh, Chris, you're up. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So I'm Chris. Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't have any show and tell stuff. Uh, honestly, I've been doing a lot of studying for for an AWS cert. Um, so I've been learning all things Amazon Cloud. Um, so kind of been in a different direction. Um, but I do have a question. I guess. I mean, just curious. What? Um, I guess, like, what, are, what does the future look like, like, after these classes and kind of just kind of drop off? You think you'll teach, like, bash here and there every once in a while? I know that you have sometimes you do, like, Saturday classes of different things. We've got Kubernetes coming up on June 3rd. Whatever the first Saturday of June is, we're doing Kubernetes. Okay. Um, we're going to do Kubernetes again after that. Um, if there's enough interest, I would be happy to rerun this class. Uh, um, I, I definitely need to, uh, get, you know, half a dozen people paying because that's the, that's the big problem that I need to fix with SFS is that we're having all of the fun, but, uh, we're having a hard time growing our capital to the point where we can start to think about things like, how do we build our building um, mm. or how do we go from a Volkswagen van to a software freedom school bus? Um, you know, we, we, those are the kinds of goals that we want to be hitting. And in order to do that, we, uh, we have to fix our uh, revenue problem. Um, gotcha. so I would love, love, love to do a uh, bash again. Um, I know that there's also some interest in Python programming. So um, I'd like to see that one come up. Okay. Uh, DevOps camp is coming up in August. Um, <laughs> July, we're doing our security thing, penetrations and remediations. That one looked pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Such a blast. It's... It's like, uh, it's like CTF. Um, it's basically like we're all sitting in a room pretending to be hackers together. It's really fun. Um, uh, August. We, we have something coming up in August. Um, and I'm also trying to squeeze in an SFS method. Um, having said that, uh, waiting for me to do a class personally can turn into kind of a bottleneck. So I want to recommend that if you want a class to happen, if there's, if your topic, it, it, you want it to happen and I'm looking busy for the next few months, make it happen. Um, put to, w tell me, you know what, David, I want to put together a peer bash programming group. Great. Uh, I will provide all the infrastructure and you guys run a peer bash programming group. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, 
I'm probably not going to run it again personally until after DevOps camp is over because I got to focus up and get my materials for that to the point where they are as delightful as Linux, the Linux camp materials. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Uh, uh, Corey. <laughs> I'm going to mute mine. Um, Okay, I'm Court. Uh, and I did work on Anacron a little bit this week, and I'm just going to kind of show you uh, which one is it. Um, share that screen. Yay! So here is. Transparent console. <laughs> Um, and, <laughs> and here's where I didn't get very far. Basically, I added the, the last couple lines here to my cron daily. And when I run it, it obviously doesn't run because I have some sort of a syntax issue going on, which takes me back to how do I get this back? Where's my share screen button? Stop share. Share screen. Switch to this one. Uh, is that what they're seeing? Anacron? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I'm pretty sure I have just a basic syntax error. I'm not sure I'm dumping the correct plain text. It's a simple command and it, it works in bash fine but once i throw it in anacron it's obviously throwing some errors so that's where i'm at but i've been playing around a little week a little bit this week so i think i think my hunch is that the problem is uh in naming my guess is that uh anacron jobs might need unique names like 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 one of your jobs was named cron.daily correct um Try naming that job something else. Try naming it Griselda. Okay. And just see what. Oh, I see, see what you're what saying. Because see what or if there is a behavioral change. Yeah. I, my my hunch is that uh, they need unique names. I don't know that. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. All right. At any rate, um, I'm gonna un I'm gonna mute this, so I'm passing it back to Mr. Wilson. How how jealous are you, huh? Huh? <laughs> Perfect for DOS, man. Doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> I, I have no idea what that is. I'll be honest. <laughs> you, there's not it a. Looks, bit it looks dated though. Just, hair. just looking at the image. Yeah. Wow. What is? It's, uh, it's got like a giant 15-inch CRT. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> When, back when monitors were the size of a small car. But I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, what is this? This next 15 minutes is for talkie talk. So um, we're actually, I'm, I'm going to mix the talkie and the show and tell uh, totally up. I'm, I'm not going to do anything conceptual. I'm going to dive straight into the issues because there is a ton of stuff to see in the issues. Um, the first thing that I want to do, let me sh do a share screen and um, then you guys tell me whether my screen fits. Uh, all right, Does my, is, is my screen too, un, is it uncomfortably large? Oh, it looks good to me. Great. Is that workable? Yeah. All, right. All right. 
Um, so I'm gonna close out these things. Um, not, yeah, I'm not actually gonna close any more stuff. I'm gonna pull up a different Mozilla window so I can isolate the work that we're doing here. Um, for my bash, bash class. We're gonna take a look at a couple of different things. The first thing I wanna do is catch up with ses session three. We ended up spending so much time on um, mail and cron last week that I didn't even show you the other two things that I wrote just as toys to, uh, to do last week. So real quick look at them and then we're gonna jump into this week's stuff. This was a thing that I wrote to test functions, both as, um, you know, how, how you define them and what the syntax of that looks like, and also what variables look like from within functions and without functions. So this script is specifically to help you as a troubleshooting tool to, um, both to both to define functions to find a syntax that you like well um, if you want to use this very verbose way of doing it if you want to use this less verbose way of doing it if you want to use this c-ish syntax that's okay they are all function definitions and they are functionally equivalent huh Huh? Nothing? So that was one of the things in my script. Functionally equivalent. But okay. You went through this whole thing just because you had that joke to do that. I <laughs> um, how this might sound ridiculous, but how do you, and maybe you would do that in here. I don't know, but how do you call the function in the body of the script? Because uh, yep. I was defining variables and then in my body of my script in the for loop, I would, you know, dollar that variable to get that. And then I right. tried it the other way where instead of declaring it a variable, I made it a function. I didn't know how to, I would just use the function name and I would try all these different things, function, yep. paren, paren, and nothing worked. Yep. Um, so that, that's, that's actually what the script is for, is to um, illustrate how to define a function and then how to invoke it and what variables look like within and without the, whoops, what the hell was that about? And then um, how to, uh, I lost my place. My brain fell out. All right. Hey, hey, David, can you just make sure you repeat? Like, I, I didn't really, I didn't hear anything you really said. Um, so just like repeat the questions if you don't mind. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, so Rich, or Jimmy Dack, sorry, was asking, and I, everybody knows you. Um, it's really not that hard to figure out who you are. <laughs> um, one of the few people that I know whose last name is a verb. Um, so Jimmy Dack was asking, um, how do you invoke a function? Once you've defined it within your script, how do you then invoke it? How do you use it, in other words? And I was saying, that's the whole point of this uh, script, is just to have enough code to exemplify how you do that, how you define a function, and how you invoke a function. And then the one thing that it does beyond that is to show the difference between arguments um, to the function and arguments to the script itself. So let's play with it a little bit and then, and then we'll move on. Um, this is still leftovers from session three. So function test, all function test does is calls those functions, it defines the functions, it defines the function this, that, and the other thing. I need to split my screen better. There we go, split it that way. Yep, there. 
good. Um, so define the functions, then call the functions, and finally run type against the functions so that we can see how bash is representing them in its own memory. Remember that, uh, so let's, let's step through that. The first thing I do is define a function named this, which outputs its arguments. So when I call it down here, actually at first I run these echo lines and the output of those is here, uh, right there. So outside of function, dollar zero is dot slash function test. That's the name of the program. Dollar zero is always the name of the program that I just invoked. And dollar at is the arguments to the script. Because I called it without arguments, that's an empty string. If I called it with um, some arguments, then we would see a different list of arguments there. Dollar at would look like that instead of an empty string. Make sense? Okay. So then we go into the function. This happens to be the function named this. Um, and we pass it an argument of one. Here's the function invocation right here. On the, I'm uh, over on the left now. Do you guys see my mouse pointer, by the way? Okay, good. So yeah. when I'm moving it from side to side, you're not uh, complete. I'm not completely losing you. So I call the function named this and it outputs its little diagnostic stuff. So we're within a function. The name of the function is this, but dollar zero is not the name of the function. Dollar zero is still function test, the name of the script that was called but dollar at when you're inside the uh, function and dollar one and dollar two and dollar three are the arguments to the function, not the arguments to the script. Does that make sense? Okay, so dollar zero doesn't change, but dollar at and dollar one, two and three do change. Um, so, then we call a function named that, and we call the function named the other thing, and those only exist to show different syntaxes for defining functions. So they do their little outputs. And then finally, we say, what is the type of this and that and the other thing? We know, we know that they're all functions, and so it should return that they're functions, and that's what it does. It says, this is a function, and then it shows Bash's internal representation of the function definition, which is this business right here. It says that is a function, and it says that's what that's the definition of that. The other thing is also a function, and here's the definition of the other thing. So you can see the uh, type, by the way, is is this bash internal that goes through all of the possible resolutions of an arg zero in order, <clears throat> and it tells you how that arg zero gets resolved. Bash wants to resolve it first as a function, then as an alias, then as an external program. So when you run type ls, it says ls is an alias. Uh, if you had defined ls as a function, then it would say that it was a function instead. Um, I'm pretty sure that functions come before aliases. I might have that backwards. Um, questions here? Do you want me to so, dive into something? So if you had a script, the problem I was having, here in your script, you just say this, and it just calls that function. Um, mm -hmm. So I had a function, and within the function, it did a for loop that um, that grabbed. Um, in this case, it was like a TCP dump data, and you know, grabbed an object and got it into these columns and whatever. And so I just did, had the function, uh, and 
there was nothing else in the script other than function, and then after the function, I just had the function name to call the function, and then I ran the script similar to what you did, and saw, ah, it ran the function, it did what it was supposed to do. But then if I used that function within anything meaningful, I wanted to use that function within uh, another, maybe with another for loop or another something, you know, where I was like, you know, for function in something, or for or for I in function, do something, and I wanted it to run that function and grab everything out of it and do something to it, and it didn't like that. If that makes any sense. Yes. So it was, when I did something simple like just say the function name, yes, it did what it was supposed to mm -hmm. do, but that's not too meaningful in that case. Why even have the function? Just just do the thing. Just echo the things. You know, don't even make it a function. So, for, you know. so the the reason why you use functions, um, the the main reason why there's 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 two. Um, you do it for readability to take a long block of complex code and move it aside, so that it, essentially you're you're offering the person that's reading your script the opportunity to mentally fold that code away, um, and and you're giving it a name. Uh, so very similar to the reason why we write scripts uh, instead of doing everything interactively. You're bagging up a bit of code, giving it a name, and then making it callable as a script. So that's one good reason to do it. The second good reason to, to define a function is if you want to do very similar things at two different places within your script, then you would use a function and so the place where I'm finding myself using functions a lot now that um, I really know better how to use them is I'm always writing the usage function first and the usage function just dumps to the screen how to use this program. Um, and then I can call and, and it exits with an error and that's all it, all usage does. And um I call it from lots and lots of different places in the program when I find that my sanity checks aren't passing. So if you called this program with the wrong number of arguments, I call usage. If you called this program with invalid arguments, I call the usage function. But I don't want to have to repeat the usage function in all, every one of those tests. Instead, I make the, uh, I don't want to repeat that code in all these different places. So I just call the usage function. And if I wanted to um, tell you exactly what you did wrong, then maybe I would do uh, output a, a more specific error and then call the usage function. Or I might pass the error message as a parameter to the usage function as an argument. Um, Sure. Sure. Um, it it is on. Yeah, it's it's in our project in GitLab. So if you've get, uh, cloned our project, then just do a git pull, and you'll get it. It's in session three. All right. So I had another leftover from session three, uh, which is going to come up here in a second. Um, which was pinger. Uh, because somebody asked in Mattermost during the course of that week, how do I do a loop ping? And there's a cup that was you. Um, so there's a couple of tricks because I've written loop ping so freaking many times. I found a couple of tricks that make loop ping way less painful. Like I don't want it to wait. 30 seconds for a timeout or even 10 seconds for a timeout on a ping. I just wanted to try the ping and then come back. And so um, the dash W switch does that. It says timeout in one second and the dash C switch makes it um, only try to do one ping. I would do C1, so it would cut down on that, but the dash W one, I wouldn't know. So that says if you, if you ping and you can't, 
a zillion seconds before you come back. It cuts the timeout down to just one second. Uh, now, if I'm, it, 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 is that enough time to have a valid chance for that? Yeah, if that's for if for whatever reason that's not enough time, you can just boost that up to like three seconds or. or whatever's practical to your purpose. Um, so. Does that also work for the phone line? If we just did batch? Is that what you're? Yeah. Are those two switches? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah, they sure do. So um, this, this also illustrates a couple of other things. It illustrates brace expansion. Mm -hmm. um, because there's two brace expansions within this string, it illustrates the multiplicative effect of brace expansions. So this brace expansion expands to four different values. Um, uh, it also illustrates um, uh, suppressing the output. And it illustrates a compound statement. This, this curly brace thing is a compound statement so that that whole piece uh, ends up being evaluated as one thing instead of multiple things so that it can be handled within the um, ampersand and double bar construct. Uh, do this and do this or do that. Uh, and so there, here's another compound after the or. So in other words, if, if this command succeeds, Dump everything on the floor, but if the command succeeds, do this. Echo dollar underscore into good hosts. Who knows what dollar underscore is? Last argument to the previous command. Last argument of the last expression. So, so you'll know the what IP address. IP address. Exactly. So, uh, my bash teacher, Jeff Hamer, um, pronounces that dollar underscore it. He pronounces it it. Um, so how often have you run this little loop where you make a directory and then you CD into it? He, he does that as this. He will, when he codes that on a command line, he says, make dir sum dir. Whoops, and if that, if that works, CD into it. Notice that my working directory is now Sumder. Okay, so it seems to be a pretty good uh, pronunciation for dollar underscore. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, kind of neat. Um, I need to get rid of that directory. Yes. Yes, it was. He's, uh, whoops, that's not what I meant. Um, Ooh, is it aired because he was trying to rm dot dot rm dir dot dot? <laughs> was that the? Yeah, it. Uh, from your last expression. Yeah, I I I could easily have um, shot off my own leg there by by doing <laughs> things from too quickly. So let's run pinger and see what it actually does. Um, the, the point of pinger is to, at the, at the console, I only want a dot for a successful ping or an X for an unsuccessful ping. And then I wanted to log all the output in these host files, uh, good hosts and bad hosts. So there's bad hosts and good hosts, and bad hosts has those, and good hosts has those. Uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes those, but those are Google's public DNS servers. Okay. If you ever need DNS servers for a machine, those work fine. They're also pingable, which makes them good for something like this. So anyway, that just uh, pinger just illustrates some some fun little looping and compound statementing stuff. Any questions about pinger? Yeah, lots of times Google ever shuts off or 
Twitter as he did and stuff like most people do. They just screw up everybody's Every. script and test it. Everybody will do it and go, oh, God, our network's broken, you know, because that's it. That's like, you just can't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. All right, so now we're now we're 21 minutes into my time, and we've just barely covered all of the leftovers. I think that's funny as hell. Um, we're we're uh, we're getting into the session four stuff. I need to make sure that everything is checked in. Okay, everything is checked in. Good hosts and bad hosts are actually not things I want checked in. Um, all right, so this week we're working on the issues and I will read you them dare issues. Issue number one, oh, is, is by Alex. Uh, he asked, <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> I don't have to kiss anybody, at least not today. Um, search logs for any entry within roughly the last 30 minutes. And I took it up um, a notch and I wrote log slicer to basically take any particular, any sized um, slice of the log, as long as it's a time slice. And he gave, some really good example data here. Um, he said, here's an example of error log, uh, or an example of some lines from error log, an example of some lines from access log, which gave me good example data to work with to demonstrate that I had actually solved the problem. Um, so I put in my comment here. Um, if the target system is modern, look at journal CTL. Journal CTL, um, collects log messages like syslog. So let me, let me say that a, a different way. Like syslog D, like syslog D, journal D, I think it's journal D, but I'm not sure, collects log messages, but it collects them as m richer data than uh, syslog did. One of the things that it collects is the timestamp. So journal CTL, it is trivial with journal CTL. It's trivially easy to say for that unit, give me all of the log messages from this time to that time. Um, and all you have to do is run journal CTL double dash help and you get those three um, things. If on the other hand, you're looking at a text log file, you're on an older system that doesn't have journal CTL or for whatever reason, you uh, don't have access to the system journal. That's where this script will um, hopefully come in handy. I wrote a thing called log slice and we're gonna take a look at it. This is my solution to issue number one. Um, notice that I've turned uh, access log and error log into files so that I can operate on them. And my utility is called log slice. The first thing that I did was write usage and then I made a sanity check that says, if you don't give me enough arguments, I give you back the usage message. And I need to make my screen a little bit wider because my examples are a little bit wider. Oof. There we go. All right. That's, uh, my examples are way, way too damn wide. Um, the so log slice gets invoked with a date finder which has to be a regex and i'm going to talk about a date finder in a minute and a from date and an until date from date i don't discuss from date uh in the usage message so i'm going to discuss it verbally right now uh from date and until date must be compatible with the date external program. So remember last time that we got together, 
for a time or two that we got together, we talked about how date can take a date argument and as long as it understands what you're trying to say, it will return a date formatted however you want. So as long as you give from date and until date in ways that are scrutable to um, the date program, they'll work with the log slice script. The date finder regex, I'm going to come back to the examples in a second. The date finder regex must start with a beginning of the line anchor, must end with the end of the line anchor. You have to mark the the beginning of the date in the pattern with a backslash left parenthesis, and you have to mark the end of the date with right uh, backslash, backslash right parenthesis. Sorry, this is complex. It's regexes. Um, so, and, th and then this is to match anything. Uh, so here, now, now we can dive into the examples. Um, log slice from the beginning of the line, look for a literal square bracket. Remember that square brackets mean something to the regex system, right? So if you want a literal square bracket, you need to put a backslash in front of it. So at the beginning of the line, look for a literal square bracket and Notice over here in error log, there's a literal square bracket at the beginning of the line. Start recording the date there. Start recording the date after the literal square bracket. Is this making sense so far? Okay, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm too far into the rabbit hole and, and it just doesn't make any sense anymore, you have to stop me because uh, otherwise I'm, I'm just gonna keep talking. Um, all right, match anything up to 2018 and then stop recording the date before the next literal square bracket. Does that make sense? Stop recording the date before the next literal square bracket, match out the rest of the line to the end of the line. What are these anchors for? What are these parenthetical anchors for? They're to mark the date that you want to, um, you, you, you've got to remember that the point of log slicer is to pull out the section of the log that's between two timestamps. Um, I might want the last 30 minutes of the log or I might want the thir 30 minutes uh, before midnight on Thursday. In order to do that, I've got to be able to figure out which section of that log line is the date, and then I have to be able to turn it into a date. The way that you do that is by marking the boundaries of the date within the line. Make sense? Okay, we're gonna we're we're gonna dive into the uh, program here in a second, and um, it'll become even more opaque. Um, here's a, here's so here's a beginning timestamp, here's an ending timestamp, and those are cromulent for the date program. And I'm pulling in from access log, pull in access log, and then slice out all of the dates, slice out all of the lines where the date is between these two dates. Does that make sense as a statement? It does, as a statement. All right. For this, for the other one, for the error log, I had to write a program to prep the error logs uh, dates because the error logs dates are not cromulent for the date program. So I had to write a program to convert them. Yeah, it took like three hours. I was, I had such a, I had a programmer's buzz after this. It was awesome. 
So this is, this is error log. Date has no idea what to do with this. No. It looks at this and it goes, what is blah? Right. So I had to write a program to prep those dates and turn them into cromulent dates. So that's what I did. I said, convert error logs dates. And let me show you what they look like after that. So after conversion, uh, they look like this. And these make sense to date. Date knows how to interpret those. You wanna see, do you wanna see what the uh, date prepper looks like or should I skip past that and leave that as magic? It'd be cool to see. Okay, we'll <laughs> cast the deciding vote, Corey. All right, then I will dive into it quickly and then we'll come back and look at the other thing. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna be horribly over time tonight. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, convert error log dates. It's a one-liner. It's a big said one-liner. Um, it pulls from error log and it does this ugly, said script um I'm first impressed for, what i'm impressed oh good good <laughs> it's it's um it's horrible uh it <laughs> took a very long time to get this done uh so the the pipe is the parser for the set line you've probably seen set lines as s slash what you look for slash what you replace it with and then another slash You've seen those, I hope? Okay. No, actually, so could you just real briefly just explain what said does? I've never used that. The, the, the S command of said, so first of all, said is a programming language. The S oh. command of said searches for the anchors between the first two parsing symbols, which are here, and then replaces them with whatever's between the second two parsing symbols, which is here. Um, it has the ability to populate and replay variables, which I'm using in here. Um, this is a little hard to read, so I'm gonna do a really quick said one-liner at the command prompt. Um, all right, Windows is the best OS ever let's see if that worked okay that worked um but since that's not true we're going to use a <coughs> sed command to fix it all right and that's a nice simple sed command search for this replace it with that so so david when you said sed is a, a programming language did you mean it's it's just uh i mean you you just meant that as a command right uh, say that again said is said is just a command right set right so said is a command like bash is a command um, okay and but when you run bash you give it expressions and if you give it a file full of expressions then you can then you can say that bash is a programming environment it huh. runs, it interprets programs okay some of those programs are very short ones like like that one that was a that was a really short one line program um, some of them are multi line so there's a there's a multi line program some of them you record into files said is the exact same way it is a program interpreter it is a programmable interpreter huh. okay yes just just like bash is a language said is a language um, I've never written anything more complex than a one-liner in said. Gotcha. But I write this stupid one-liner in <laughs> said over and over and over and over. Um, 
So, huh? Okay. I'm going to read this little bit of magic uh, to you, and then we're going to move into the actual log slicer program. Um, so, this is a regex. Uh, from from this pipe to this pipe is a regex. The first thing to do is to start capturing and capture a pattern that is one or two digits. Uh, this is a quantifier. This right there is a quantifier of this right here. So look for a look for one look for a pattern that is one or two let me do that again that is one or two digits long that is to match the day of the month you guys can see the highlights that i'm doing right yeah. okay good so the that this regex right here is to match the day of the month then I'm looking for a literal forward slash. That's why I couldn't do S slash 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 like I normally do. Normally I do these slashes. I needed a different parser. Whatever you do after the S is your parser for said. So because I used a pipe, I didn't have to um, do a whole bunch of backslashing to isolate my slashes. So I'm looking for a literal slash which is way up here. See that literal slash? All right. So you've, ca you've captured date of the month, gone, uh, skipped past the slash, and now you're capturing again. See this backslash parenthesis? Capturing again, and you're capturing three and only three alphabetical characters. What's that? What's three alphabetical characters? Are you, you're capturing the month, exactly. And then you're matching literally 2018, which I didn't bother to capture. So the first thing that I captured gets played here. What was that? Day of the month. And then the second thing I captured gets replayed here. That was? Name of the month, right? And then I output a literal 2018. So I've turned a non-cromulent date into a cromulent date. Oh, and I, and I replaced the, um, the colon with a space. Whoops. All right. All right. So that's what we did with error log. And then I did one more example with log slice and the usage thing of um, log slice from a live log, which you can, um, you can practice with this. So I'm gonna run all these and show you what exactly what they do. So pulling in from access log, it should output. In, what? Okay. Instead of outputting all of access log, instead of outputting um, however many lines it is, uh, 27 lines, it outputs only one, two, three, four lines that are between these times. So we've literally gotten a slice of access log. Um, Let's take a, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, no, no I am gonna, mm, no, I'll do another example after we dive into the program. Let's take a quick look at the program. I'm gonna use Adam so that we get uh, color coding. I should have called it log slicer instead of log slice. So there's the usage function. And I first, the first thing that I do is check to see that you either gave me two or three arguments. If you didn't give me two and you didn't give me three, then I output the usage message and crash. 
uh, if you did give me two, the date filter, the thing that cuts the date from the log line, I use uh, arc one as the date filter. From date S is the secondly timestamp that I interpret from the cromulent date that you gave in dollar two, in arg two. Remember the arg two, um, bringing that back here. Remember that arg two, whoops, arg two, let me try this again. Arg one has to be the date cutter. Arg two has to be the from date. So when you take a date like this and you give it to date, uh, date equals that, and then you say output it as plus S, you get a numeric, you get the number of seconds since the, how do you pronounce the word E-P-O-C-H? Epoch. Epoch. So you get the number of seconds since the epoch. If you ever want to do that for the, uh, just right now, notice that that's literally counting the seconds since the epoch. So now I have something that is an integer that I can use for comparisons. The number of seconds since the epoch is a good way to do date math. Uh, all right, going back into the script, I turn from date into an integer. I turn until date into an integer, but you might not have given me an until date. That one's optional. Until date, uh, if you didn't provide it, is right now. So if you provided it, I turn whatever you provided into an integer. If you didn't provide it, I turn the current date into an integer. Make sense? Yes, okay. Uh, so now, I, since I have now the bottom and the top of the range, I can go start reading the lines out of whichever log file you gave me. So I read the lines out of whichever log file you gave me. I cut out the line date using the regex that you gave me to capture the, um, the date. The date cutter captures the date into, because of those parentheses, captures the date into the register named one for said. Said plays that back out, um, sorry, said plays that yeah said plays that back out um so all that this line date is doing is cutting out the date from the line then date actually does the work of turning that line date into an integer just like it did with those other two dates now it's got to do a comparison if the line date in seconds is greater than or equal to the from date in seconds and the line date in seconds is, I don't know why that's even working. Greater than or equal to, oh no, it is, is you're right. It's, it's less than or equal to, you're right. It's, that's, that's, it's working because it, I wrote it correctly. Jeez, I was uh, freaked out for a second. Um, and it's less than or equal to the until date, then echo the line. Otherwise, it's the line date is too old or too new. Wow. This is a very uh, intense script, but very useful. And... Uh, my, my hope is that this is readable and something that you'll be able to learn from, not necessarily, not necessarily be able to write stuff like, or write it, 
not necessarily be able to write stuff like this right now today, but at least look at it and go, okay, I understand how you did that. And I can then transfer that tool into this other script that I need. Um, and, and maybe even use this script in your daily work. If you need to see just a particular window of uh, log entries. All right, so let's take a look at the other two runs, um, the other two examples of log slice. So this one, remember convert error log dates turns the dates that date can't deal with into dates that date can deal with. Then it outputs those dates or that reformatted error log essentially because what convert error log does is it turns turns error log into legible dates and we pipe that into log slice and have it filter out all of the lines that are too old or too new so let's see how that looks um, let's very quickly get the lines from error log. Error log has 37 lines. We want to make sure that we're only seeing the lines that are in this half an hour range. Um, did I do that right? Did I, did I say within a half? No, I, I said newer than 10 p.m. that night. I did not provide a, a, I didn't provide an until, I only provided a from. Mm -hmm. So I'm only cutting off lines that are older than a certain time. The until uh, is right now. One more example run of log slice. Um, this is going into var log syslog and line by line it's reading through those lines and um, when it gets to lines that are within the last 10 minutes it will output them if it if it gets to lines that are within the last 10 minutes I don't know how big that file is. It does, it does take a little bit of processing to uh, work. Well, come on. All right, I don't, I don't know what the problem is there. Maybe that file is yeah, that file is a little too long. Um, it's grinding through those 371,000 lines, uh, and it's not efficient at all. All right, so that's log slice. Uh, I spent enough time on it that, as you can see, I'm a little obsessed with it. Sorry. It was... Uh, it was an awful lot of fun to write. So Alex, thank you for uh, issue number one. Back into the issues and I'm eventually gonna stop talking. Um, issue three, uh, issue two was closed uh, last week because it was about um, mailing out of cron. Uh, issue three was a bash auto update script that will detect the Ubuntu LTS version and do the right thing. And then also how to, how to ban some, something from that update. Uh, so in my comment, I gave you a couple of see also's about how to pin packages um, the, the script that I wrote just does the update, the package pinning, you need to do that manually until you're set on a particular set of packages and versions 
and then you will write the scripts that get those versions and then pin them. Um, the, the, the process goes like this. You'll use Madison to find out which versions of a given package are available. You'll install some version and then you'll use a binary search to find the newest version of the package that passes all your tests. You're going to have to write tests to figure out which version of the given package you want. So if you know that the latest version of the package doesn't work, well, what is the latest version of the package that does work? And you can, you can solve that two ways. Let's say that the current version is version four. And you've just you figured out that, and, and I'm going to use libx font as my example. Let's say libx font is at version four. You figured out version four doesn't work with your your company's product. Now you want to figure out which version it does work with. You have two ways to figure that out. You can either go to version three and test or you can do a binary search. I recommend doing a binary search. Go to some really old version, um, like the last known good version. So we know that it worked in, and I need to, I need to make my number larger. Um, the current version is 300. Uh, we know that it last worked at version 200. So, Install version 200, rerun your tests, make sure that you have that as your last known good, and now you have two pins. A binary search is splitting the difference between what you know is good and what you know is bad. So you go to version, what's halfway between 100 and 300? 200. And you test it. If it's good, you move your good pin. If it's bad, you move your bad pin, and then you split the difference again. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So use a binary search to find the newest version of the package that passes all your tests. Uh, hold that package at the current version, aptmark hold that, once you have that version installed. Uh, at that point, um, the next, DevOps is the art of continuously improving, not the art of producing perfect solutions. After you get this far, you now build a database of our, our application works with these versions, and now you can write scripts that, ins that specifically install those versions of those libraries and pin them um, and, and that will allow you to scale. Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to the any old Ubuntu up to date script, which is, thank God, not quite as uh, complex as Log Slicer. Let me get into the right directory, and then I'll be able to pull it up. Did I rename it? Oh, I renamed it. <laughs> I, re I renamed it, but I didn't. Um, I didn't update my comment in that ticket. All right. So what we're doing here is we're getting the version of Ubuntu, and we're turning it into an integer. So let's. Um, let me pull this over to the left. There we go. And run these piece, run this piece by piece so you can see how it's constructed. LSB release dash R gives you the release. You can also do dash A to get all the information. We don't need all the information. We only need the release. Piping that to TR dash D turns it Oh, whoops. Delete dot turns the release into an integer by getting rid of the dot in the middle of it. 
doing number math with um, decimal fractions in Bash is not possible. So since, since we can't do it, we're not going to do it. Uh, then the next piece we do is a little awk to get the second thing from the line. The second thing from the line after some white space. Whoops. That's what I get for trying to talk and type at the same time. Is this. Remember, awk is great for this. Awk is great for turning any blob of white space into a delimiter and then breaking that line into numbered fields. So dollar one is the first blob, then some white space. Dollar two is the second blob, then some white space. This is what awk is great at. Uh, so I got the second blob and I say, back up here, if that second blob is greater than or equal to 1710, alias apt-get to apt. That way, for the whole rest of the script, I don't have to care whether the system is apt-get based or apt based. Make sense? Yep. yep. Okay. So, uh, basically, I've just masked apt-get to apt um, if and only if it's a recent version. I don't know that 1710 is the minimum version where everything is supported in apt. Um, I'll leave that the exact uh, version as a search exercise for the student. There is some threshold. I don't know what that threshold is. I do know this though, that if you set for 1710, you'll never be disappointed because 1710 definitely does it, and 1710 and 1704 also understand all the apt-get commands. So it's at some point in the far distant future where they're gonna drop support for the apt-get commands. Uh, so this, this script should never disappoint. Uh, I wrote it to do the usual things now. Um, with or without the alias, uh, update information about available packages, dump packages that are no longer needed, upgrade the whole box to the latest packages. Upgrade does not take you between versions. That's not what it does, um, even, th even though it's named upgrade. Um, it keeps you in this version. Uh, dump obsolete packages again, uh, just because it's it's cheap. It doesn't it doesn't cost much to dump packages, um, especially if there are no packages to dump. And then finally, schedule a reboot for ten minutes from now. So this does work. I've used it on a couple of different Ubuntu boxes. Um, This is with the alias, by the way, because my system is 1710. It's dumping packages it doesn't need anymore. It's installing any packages, and then it schedules a reboot for 10 minutes from now, which I am going to very quickly cancel. Because <laughs> I don't want it to reboot 10 minutes from now. Okay. Any questions about that one? Or was that? That's cool. No, that's great. That's totally great. And you're right. That was a lot quicker than the uh, pause code. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So I'm not scared to write it down that Um. So going back to the list of issues, I think I only have one more. Um, this, is, this is the next Corey issue, and it was... It's just a continuation. Yeah, it was really extending that and, and, um, and saying, well, what if 
what if the uh, hard drive is full? Well, if the hard drive is full, then we should uh, check to the, the this, this I think the old POS, I think is addressed with package pinning in the last issue. So I'm going to, um, I'm only extending the script by checking for hard drive space. And I did it in this one. Ubuntu update. And I want Adam for the color coding. Uh, this one is a little bit more of a brain burner, but not, it's, I, I, I think it's still uh, pretty readable, um, but we'll see. Uh, oh, did I mention already that whenever you do these chaining symbols, they automatically extend the line? No. So you don't have to do that. Whenever you do a chain, it automatically extends the line. Okay. All right. So the 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 preamble is the same. Um, I check my version and alias apt get to apt if the Ubuntu version is very new. The next thing is update knowledge of about packages. And the next thing, remove obsolete packages. And finally, we're going to start to check for free space. Free space is phrased in megabytes, um, or it's expressed in megs, not in bowel movements, uh, megabytes. Uh, and this is where it starts to get weird and a little bit hard to read. Um, here's root min free. This is less than, but what's all this other business? We're gonna have to deconstruct this. Uh, or, or, or is this dead obvious and we don't need to deconstruct this? If I'm PF of the root file system and tail of the last single line, so you're not getting the header, I guess that's what you're doing there. And then off to get the fourth column, which should be uh, fuse. Megabytes. Turn it from K bytes to megabytes. So I guess that that was obvious. So we don't we. Yeah, that was that was absolutely correct. And then. Yes. Yep. Do you want me to you want me to deconstruct I'm just, it? I'm just, yeah. Do you ever use the POSIX flag on the uh, DF so you don't have to? I I or nay? No, I, I'm fine with his description. I think it's dead on. Okay. I'm just uh, that I don't want to get done right. The POSIX flag, the capital P on DF. Do you use that so it's like old school? You don't have those two lines and you don't have to deal with that. Anyway. Oh, I guess you. Yeah, I could have done it that way. Okay. I could have done it POSIXly. Um, okay, so if if my free space on the root partition is below this completely freaking arbitrary number that I've set up here, basically two gig, then it will come back and say free space on the root file system is low. I can't help you with that. So here's some commands that might help you with that. And I quit right here. Screw you, goodbye. <laughs> on the other hand, if the free space is low on the boot partition, if it's cool on the root part, or yeah, if it's good on the root partition, but it's low on the boot partition, this is where I do things that are jiggy. Um, so once again, uh, just, just like Rich read it, Take the free space on the uh, root. Take the free space on the root. Boot. Uh, boot, right? Not root. Um, free space on the boot partition. Turn it into megabytes. Turn that all into a number and compare it to boot min free. And if 
it's too low on bootman free and by the way i had to set bootman free at this absurdly high number because my boot partition is part of my root partition so i ended up having to tell it in, in order to get it to fire i had to tell it like if boot partition has less than 60 gig free um yeah <laughs> you got you got some really big boot buddy <laughs> why thank you um it it will start to do the same thing but but this time it's going to make suggestions it's going <clears> to <throat> actually it's not going to make suggestions i believe it's going to hit it with a hammer uh but it's it's been a few days so i don't remember anymore uh free space on slash boot is low we're just initializing package to remove as nothing because um, I ran into a thing where it doesn't know what to suggest and it goes into an infinite loop. So now I have it checking to see if it doesn't know what to suggest, it quits and it says, I give up. Um, so I, say, I suggest that you give up and try again tomorrow. Um, so it's going through a list of files. What is the list of files that it's going through? What is the, what do you think this does? Uh, what's the capital S? What is the capital S? It's, um, it's, uh, ordered by something. Well, it's not ordered by size because that's small S. It's ordered by, no, maybe it is. It's ordered by size. Yep. It's, that's exactly what it is. It's ordered by size. So it's listing the files that are in slash boot, ordered by size, getting rid of what? What don't I want to see? What's your name minus R? That, is that enough clue? That's the kernel version. Yep. So which kernel don't I want to uninstall? Which kernel do I not want this program to suggest removing? The one, the one I'm running, right? Because I know it's good. The system is up. I know that this kernel is good. I'd probably better not uninstall it. Also, I really don't know what happens if you uninstall the kernel that's currently running, but I'll bet it's not good. <laughs> the other thing I don't want to uninstall, and I don't want the program to suggest it, is memtest. So what this has what this is doing now is it's giving me a stacked list of candidates of files that I might want to remove. Those are all the files that I might maybe want to remove from, um, from slash boot. Uh, it does another validation. Hopefully this isn't log slicer level of complexity yet. Um, it does, uh, it does another check. It makes sure that for this file, so it's, it's now it's going into this list of files. Cause remember we started out with a four F four F in this size sorted list of files. Check to see if there's a package that met, that owns that file. So dpkg search for slash boot slash this one. Whoops, not this one, this one. Uh, not that one, actually, I wanted generic. Yeah, there we go. All right, so notice that uh, the generic had a package match and generic EFI signed didn't have a package match. 
I don't care about the output. I only care about the return value. So I dump the output on the floor. If there was a return, if it exited zero, in other words, if I found a package that owns this file, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If I found a package that owns this file, then the largest associated file is $f. And then I put that into humanese and I put it out on the command line. Um, the largest file on slash boot that is unrelated to the currently running kernel, but related to an install package is largest file. Okay. <clears throat> the package is that output. So I rerun that. I reran that dpackage query, okay. and I pick up the first field uh, delimiter as a colon and first field, and I use cut instead of um, lock. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, keep going? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking ahead, and I'm a little too wet. Okay. Okay. So the package with which it is associated is package to remove. Now that I've got package re to remove set to something. Oh, that's what that was. I was wondering what that dollar package to remove that was up earlier. The one you set to nothing. Okay. Yep. Um, if package, uh, package equals package. To, oh, I think I, I may have broken this. Yes, I did. I, I broke this in the last, um, there we go. Yeah, there, okay, that yeah, makes more I, sense. I was trying to, who, you're setting this thing to package. Well, the, the, now below is, okay. Yeah, the, it, this, this is why testing is so, so important because it's like, oh, I'm just gonna make this trivial little change. It can't possibly break everything. Right. Um, all right, so package to remove, package to remove. Um, that's the largest, we got the largest file that's associated with a package that is on boot. Now I have the package that owns it. I come out here and I say, if package to remove, it, if it's a zero length string, meaning I didn't come up with anything, mm -hmm. it's, it's, from, it's still from here. Mm -hmm. um, slash boot is still too full, but I found nothing to remove. You're hosed and I quit. Um, otherwise, sudo app get purge package to remove. I didn't add a dash Y to this. So the operator gets a chance to say, oh, don't do that. If you want this thing to run full auto, just add a dash Y to it. Um, and then auto remove in case there's any depths. And this, Notice that this is all wrapped in a while. So yeah. as soon as it's done this package purge and done an auto remove, it sleeps for three seconds and heads back up to the while check. What's the while check do? It checks to see if slash boot is too full. If slash boot is still too full, it goes and finds the largest associated file tells you which package it's associated with and offers to remove it for you. Yep. And it keeps doing that until you, until you run out of stuff in slash boot that it can remove or until you're below min free. Um, That's awesome. I'm gonna have to change the data free. What's that? I'm gonna have to change the data free, otherwise it's gonna clean out my boot partition. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, you, you probably want to set this to whatever megabyte makes sense for you or change the logic of the program slightly so that it, uh, so that it's a percentage instead of a megabyte. But I, I felt that megabyte was a more direct and effective hammer. Um, so that was why I went with megabyte. Uh, it was, it was, it was easier and it makes me more sure that I can do a whole kernel upgrade in that amount of space. Okay. Uh, 
finally, the, the normal apt updates and the auto re I, I doubled or tripled up on auto removes because auto removes are cheap. Um, if they, if, if there's nothing to do, they don't do anything. All right. And then the, the queue up the reboot because I like low up times. I'm not a neck beard. <laughs> low up time means low difference between the running system and the system on disk. Mm -hmm. And I like that a lot. It also means um, fewer things that I have to search if it worked on last reboot, but it doesn't work on this reboot. Long uptimes destroy both of those things. System on disk can be significantly drifted from the currently running system. And the um, number of things to search for problems is, uh, is high instead of low. Uh, would you like to see how this works? Okay. I'm going to have to boost my bootman free to absurd uh, until I get to where it'll fail. Um, yeah, 17 gigs, so I need to make it really high. Um, what is that? That's 50 gig, right? Okay. 51 gigs. So it should it should fail now. Um, watch me destroy my own my own computer. Right, straight into straight into production. What courage! What idiocy! <laughs> All right, so. And it goes out and it says, these are the packages that are available. And the free space on slash boot is low. Do you see it? The largest file on slash boot unrelated to the currently running kernel, but related to an installed package is this one. The package with which it is associated is for 13.039. Um, those packages will be uninstalled. Um, I don't think so. It's possible, though. Nope, I'm running 41. All right, so... So these are the packages that will be removed. Do you really want to do this? You'll pick up a whopping 238 megabytes, which is going to take you so much closer to 50 gigabytes free. On a real boot partition, that's just the right, right. So I'm, I'm going to let it purge. And it purges the crap out of that crap. And then finally, it says slash boot is still too full, but I found nothing to remove. You're on your own, cupcake. <laughs> I, I need to put that into my. Uh, I need to put that into my error message. Um, so now I'll come back here and uh, set this to a saner number, like I like two fifty six. And close that. Hi, honey.
So what's cool is that I think that we went through a lot of neat stuff. What's uncool is that I've talked and demoed an hour over my allotment, almost an so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pause video for um, so, so that we can do practicing. Um, stopping my share. Stop share. Stop share. There we go. And I'm going to pause recording. We're going to start with Rich Jimmy Doc, and he's going to do his outro. This will be real quick. I just wrote another um, log splicing script that'll just, it's just another hour. That's all I ask. I just have this uh, <laughs> log script that I want to go over. Oh, okay. Just kidding. <laughs> it was good. Um, good class. I, I'm going to miss this next Wednesday, so maybe we'll do it again sometime. Good to meet you, Chris, and maybe I'll see you around. And, uh, yeah, peace out. All right. All right. Call somebody. Who are you, Chris? Oh, me. Uh, Chris, you're up. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm Chris. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any pie or beer with me right now. Uh, uh. Yeah, yeah. But uh, hopefully, uh, actually, never mind. Um, so I'm just going to screen share real quick um, something I was working on. I was just pretty much uh, just playing around here. All right. With, um, mostly with using said, but then, I don't know, I haven't used um, awk that much as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, let's see. What is it? Uh, all right. So here I just said, hi, my name is Bob and I'm adding some more text. So then I said, um, and I did a search for Bob and replaced Bob with my name, Chris. Um, and then, and then I, so I did that first, right? It was just getting. Oh, I didn't know said executes right. automatically. Hey, I just learned something. Oh, without doing the, the flag E, dash E? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's not working right now. Oh, no, it is. What am I talking about? Sorry. Um, and then, yeah, so hold on one second. Confusing myself. All right, so when I do it with awk, then it just prints off the name Chris, which is the fifth, uh, the fifth word. Um, and so then, so yeah, before that, it did switch out with Chris. Um, and then with awk, I was just kind of trying to figure out, um, real briefly, if there was a way to, to tell it to print, uh, dollar five and everything after dollar five without putting it in some kind of loop or something like that. Dollar five space dollar N F. Apparently dollar five to dollar N works. Two dollar N? Uh, space oh. dollar capital N capital F. Try that. Oh, I'll oh, smush yeah, it yeah. all together. So you yeah, might yeah, want to yeah. put something yep. in there that'll. You're totally right. Dollar, capital N, capital F. Just, yep, try that. Okay. Oh, no. Okay, so that's the last field. Um, oh. Try, is, is, there a, um, is there a range operator like is. dot, dot, or, or dash? It's another thing. It's not NF. It's, um, there is something. Okay. You might have I to man, uh, Awk and there's there's some of these try try putting dot dot between those two things or, yeah or dash between the five and the nf yeah. and delete that as well wait delete what oh the dollar delete the dollar there okay try that nope um try Dot, dot, dot is the operator? No, I, it, there's a question. Is it dot, dot, or dot? Let me see. Try, try dollar NF at the end there. Uh, okay. Uh, capital NF? Yep. Ah. 
That's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I tried just a few things. I figured, yeah, either like dollar N or some kind of, yeah, like dot, dot. But anyways, that's where I got. Um, so I was just messing around there. That's cool. I dig it. There's yeah. a, yeah, there is a range operator. I just don't know what it is off the top Here, of my there, head. Here's something that says, um, okay, they're doing an NF, but he's doing a like greater than equal NF. Let's see. What's this guy doing? Uh, he's actually doing a loop within. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. that's ugly. We don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's something. That's a perfectly valid solution. Yeah. Right on. Well, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thanks again. Uh, yeah, I was definitely planning on being there in person uh, today, but it just didn't work out. So, um, right. yeah, I don't know if hopefully something changes and I can make it to the, the DevOps camp. That would be awesome. I definitely. So it was funny in the email how you're talking about like uh, debating DevOps because I really didn't know what that meant. So I Googled it and yeah, it was kind of interesting how there wasn't like a, a solid answer yeah it's uh it's I, I i'm looking forward to saying devops is bullshit at least a few times uh at devops camp <laughs> um there's a, there's a lot of things that are non-bs within the science of devops but this but devops itself is just too nebulous for me it's too too buzzwordy bugs me yeah yeah <laughs> well anyways Corey. uh i guess i call on you all right i'm muting out okay reverb effect um great class uh i'm not sure who said it if it was david or somebody but i mean we could continue this for weeks on end with with new and practical material that would uh, be applicable to our, our current jobs. It's, it's a great class. I learned a bunch and uh, I'm definitely going to be applying some of this stuff that particularly from tonight and moving forward. Love it. Thanks guys. Okay. That is a wrap. It has been, um, Am I, am I making sound? Not? Okay. Yeah. Yay. All right. Um, uh, it's been a wonderful pleasure being your bash teacher. I hope I've been as good a bash teacher for you guys as Jeff Hamer was for me. Uh, God bless you. And let's do this again. All right. Thanks, David. Good night.